for an exhibition. This is a closing exhibition, um, but just the same. Uh, he had an opportunity to come by and see you guys. Okay. Um, I'm going to read this because if I get off script, we'll probably be in big trouble. Okay. Keith, thank you. Uh, Keith Knight is an award-winning American cartoonist and musician known for his accessible yet subversive comic strips, The K Chronicles, Inc., and The Nightlife. While his work is humorous and universal in appeal, he also often deals with political, social, and racial issues. Woke, a television series based on his work, debuted in 2020. Keith is a 1990 alumni <laughs> of the Salem State University and received an honorary degree just a couple, uh, just a year ago, uh, Salem State in 2022. Um, this is also co-sponsored by uh, the Center for Justice and, and Liberation and Salem State University Alumni Association and Foundation. Uh, I told Keith, this is a very informal uh, presentation. Um, you guys are welcome to ask questions. I know my students are always interested in the trajectory of how an artist and their practice kind of moves uh, through things. So I'm sure that could probably certainly be one of the questions. Um, but at that, please welcome Keith Knight. Thank you. Thank you. And, you know, frankly, I'm not going to um, I'm going to be I'm not going to be long because I'd be interested in hearing folks' questions. But um, I, I just want to say thank you, uh, Ken. This is a really wonderful exhibit. And I love how you placed everything here because um, having a career like this, it is all about movement and pivoting and twisting and turning and changing with technology, with uh, print media, going to the internet, uh, realizing that you know, uh, being a, a syndicated cartoonist isn't what it once was and, and sort of making that transition to television. Um, it's been a wonderful journey and it started here at Salem State. Um, it's weird because the Salem State Art Department has graduated two award-winning cartoonists. Mark Parisi is the other one. He graduated the year I came here. Um, there has been times where the art department has, has sent people who have inquired about cartooning at Salem State. They've sent them to me and uh, and and they ask like, so, you know, what about Salem State, you know, created these cartoonists? And I just say this, like uh, cartooning is to me is about just telling your story. And so it doesn't matter whether you go to cartooning school or a, a, a state university, it's about telling your story. And so I urge, whenever I speak to, to people, I say, tell your story, whether it's in comics or song or poetry, uh, anything, um, it's more important to tell your story because if you don't tell it, somebody else is gonna tell it and they're gonna screw it up. Uh, so um, I've been fortunate enough to tell my story for 35 plus years. And again, it started here when I came here, uh, I, I knew I wanted to be a cartoonist. There were no cartooning classes, but I was like, I will take graphic design. My parents were freaked out about me wanting to be a cartoonist. They're like, oh, okay, there's money in graphic design. Okay, okay, we'll do that. So, but uh, much to my advisor's chagrin, I, will, I would always say, listen, I'm gonna be a cartoonist anyway. I'm just gonna be a cartoonist. And he would always be like, but you gotta learn this stuff. You gotta learn this stuff. And it's true. Um, I became a better cartoonist by taking figure drawing and learning how to draw uh, the body. And once you learn how to do it, then you can deviate from it and create uh, a style that you, you come to know. Uh, I learned a lot uh, with color, using color uh, with the graphic design classes I took. I learned a lot about printing and, and printmaking. Um, I flunked ceramics, but I learned... <laughs> I flunked, so I did. But I learned a huge thing from that moment because I had a, a teacher that was like, oh, you know, you just show up when you can. You just, whenever, you just get your work done. And, and so I never showed up <laughs> and I flunked. But because of that, I learned that I was like, okay, I need like 
some sort of hard ass to like keep me on track. And that's why I knew I wanted to be a newspaper magazine cartoonist because I would always have an editor in my ear. It doesn't matter how, like I only have a handful of newspapers now because it's, I'm mostly on the web. I'm mostly doing other things, but having that person going, where is it? Where is it? Every week keeps me on track. And that's why I was able to produce the amount of work that I was, I've been able to produce. And because I was able to produce so much work over 30 plus years, um, I have probably, I don't know, 30,000 comic strips. Um, to Hollywood, that is intellectual property. And that is valuable property. And that is the type of thing that gets developed into a television show. So um, I, I, you know, if there's one thing that I am happy that I got a comic strip. I, I, I didn't get syndicated nationally until 2008. Um, I was self syndicated nationally before then, but with a syndicate, 2008 was the worst. <laughs> it was the worst year for newspapers on record. So many newspapers went out of business then. The, the economy dropped out. But at that time, I, I was creating, you know, 365, 365 days a year plus the two weekly strips I was doing. So I was creating basically nine strips every week for 11 years. It was, it was a lot. And it showed to Hollywood, oh, he can produce on a consistent basis and be funny and, and provocative and thoughtful and all that type of stuff. So, um, so yeah, I went here uh, 1984. <laughs> so I graduated in 1990. So you can, you can put that together. <laughs> I was I was not on the five five year plan, <laughs> um, but I, I loved it here. I, I I loved it in the sense that I took advantage of everything. I salivate when I look at the walls, walk through the walls here because I immediately flash back. When uh, uh, when the geology department is going to Arizona, sign up for it because they they are, they have to offer it to every student here. If you've never been to Arizona, sign up for it and go to Arizona. When the college radio station is going to New York for something, sign up for it and go to New York. These are opportunities. Do a semester overseas. Take advantage. Whenever there's free food, there's going to be free food here. <laughs> come to it. And, and the, the dessert on top is the speaker. And you, you might learn something from that speaker that you would have never thought about learning, but you came for the food. And, and so that, that education, take advantage of it. Take advantage of the school. When I was here, I, you know, <laughs> every, everybody protected, you know, hid their uh, copy machines because I, <laughs> I knew where all the copy machines were. That's the thing. <laughs> as a cartoonist, as a, as a cre uh, media creator, uh, I was making videos. I was making music. I was making news uh, newspapers, comics, and zines. I was just constantly creating and creating posters for different clubs. It's where I learned how to, and, and I don't know if one of, one of my roommates is over there, but the other roommate uh, that I had, he said, start charging now. He said, start charging now. Don't give anything for free. And, <laughs> and I, I, to this day, I tell cartoonists, you know, because still to this day with the internet, people say, oh, you know, we don't have any money, but <laughs> there's plenty of exposure. Yeah. And not with the internet. Like, <laughs> like there's, we, we have all the exposure we need. Never charge zero for anything because that person that's getting you to work for free is getting paid. Like, you know, how about I have some of your money? That's what you should say. But, um, but I took a lot of general classes that I had to get through. Um, um, and it's, it's interesting. The, the, the class that affected me the most, and I say this during my slideshows all the time, is my American literature class. Um, why was American literature so affecting? It was the first time I had a black teacher. I grew up in Malden, Massachusetts. I don't know why I didn't have a black teacher. <laughs> there were some black teachers there, but I just never had a black teacher. 
And this study that came out a few years ago, I did a uh, comic about, said if you have a black teacher between kindergarten and 12th grade, uh, a black student, uh, they have one black teacher, their uh, likelihood of going to college goes up 32%. So uh, I didn't have one, but I had a great study teacher who was black, who was in his 20s, and he just had a study class, but he doodled at the front of the class while we were studying. It turns out he wanted to be a cartoonist. And so he would invite me to sit next to him uh, and then we would draw cityscapes together and cars and different things. And just because I saw this guy that looked like me, that was 10 years older than me, wanting to be a cartoonist, it meant the world to me and it made me feel like I could do it. So jump forward to college. My first black teacher I had was a junior in college. He was an American literature teacher and he assigned us to read Richard Wright, Ralph Ellison, Maya Angelou, and James Baldwin. And someone asked, why are you giving us all black writers? And he said, I'm giving you all American writers. And that blew my mind because we, we learned that Mark Twain is, is the be all and end all of American literature. And he was basically saying to us that there's way more than that. And that opened my mind up. And, and what I was reading were folks who were writing about my experience 50, 75 years ago. And so I felt it upon myself to, to really tell my story through my comics. And that's where my comics really changed. So that was a huge thing. That was a huge thing. My next move um, was um, sort of, I was lucky enough to have a very uh, loud mouth friend. Oh, actually, most of my friends are loud mouth, <laughs> but that's, that's Boston, right? That's Massachusetts. Uh, we were in Faneuil Hall in Boston, uh, and back in the day, Faneuil Hall was actually a popular place to go. <laughs> and uh, there was a caricature cart there, and my buddy was a little bit drunk, and he's like, he's like, oh, Keith, you could do this, you could do this. <laughs> he's like, look at him, Keith, you could totally do it, and, you know, and it's like, I was like, shut up, you know, don't do him. And, uh, but the owner was there, and he's like, can you do it? And I said, yeah, yeah. And so I got hired to draw caricatures at this caricature cart for uh, four or five years. And the greatest thing about it was I was uh, partnered up with um, uh, uh, an artist. Uh, his name is Dale Stefanos. And uh, Dale was by far the greatest caricaturist I've ever seen. He was like amazing. He would take the markers and like, and then smush them and make them into like uh, brushes so we could vary the line. Like, you know, for people who knew, <laughs> like if they walked up to the cart and looked at everybody's, they'd look at mine and go, oh, no, no, no. And they look at someone else, no, no. They look at Dale's, oh, this is the guy, this is the guy. So uh, the great thing was Dale had a girlfriend uh, whose name was Maria. And she would always come to the cart and, and hang out. And she was really super nice. Most of you know her as Channel 5's Maria Stefanos. And uh, I knew her in, like when she was probably in high school, which is really interesting. But those four years of working a crowd and drawing really helped me with a lot of the um, portraits that I do. I do a portrait, a type of portraiture somewhere between caricature and portraiture, and uh, I, it's really fun to do because I love to do the research, look for the drawings, stuff like that. Anyway, Dale would always get the best jobs. He got a job, a uh, corporate job, in San Francisco. And so when he comes back, he's like, I was like, Dale, how's San Francisco? He's like, dude, it's like, you got to go to San Francisco. you got to go to San Francisco. It's like, why? Why? What's so great about San Francisco? He's like, it's like Harvard Square. This is when Harvard Square was really cool. It's like Harvard Square, but it's the whole city. And I was like, I'm going to San Francisco. I'm moving to San Francisco. So like the last year after I graduated, I worked really hard, saved up a lot of money, uh, paid off all of school. I had no debt coming out of school, which is a huge thing, huge thing. And then just jumped in the car and drove to San Francisco. And my plan was to be there for five years and just treat it as my graduate school and then go down to LA and get a television show. I loved San Francisco so much. 
I stayed there for 17 years <laughs> and it was amazing. And uh, I met my wife there. I had the greatest uh, job uh, outside of my job, which is I worked at a youth hostel. And a youth hostel is like a low cost place where people stay and share rooms and all that stuff. But I got to meet people from all over the world. So I got this really interesting perspective uh, from people from all over the world. And because I worked for this particular hosteling international um, company, I could stay for free in hostels all around the world. And so I got the travel bug and just totally took off and would go for months, uh, like a month at a time. And, and it was amazing. So that really informed my work. San Francisco informed my work because I was able to see underground cartooning and see that I didn't have to just do a strip. I could do these longer stories and I could talk about sex, drugs, and rock and roll and all this different stuff. And so it really, that was, San Francisco was a huge influence on me. So much so that people to this day still think I live in San Francisco, especially <laughs> with the show. Um, so uh, I, that's about 10 years. Now it's like 15 years I've been out, out of San Francisco. So um, I watched print die in San Francisco. I watched the internet take over. And you know, being in San Francisco and the t seeing the tech boom, I saw it come in pretty much before the rest of the country did. In fact, I did <laughs> in the late 90s for Pac Bell, it doesn't exist anymore, but I did graphic recording. Uh, graphic recording is when you take notes at a meeting and you just like you do them in doodles and, and they take pictures and it helps uh, people retain what's going on there. It's a, it's a great job as a cartoonist, they pay well. Um, Pac Bell was talking in the late 90s about this thing that's coming where everybody's gonna have a phone, even children. <laughs> and if they don't pay their bill, we can turn off the phones. And I, I was like, I was, I, you know, I'm right there going, this is science fiction, like, whole, like serious? And I remember uh, heading back to my apartment going, guys, like, you don't understand. It's like, everyone's gonna have a phone in their pocket and like <laughs> kids, children, and they, they just turn things off. Um, <laughs> they thought I was crazy, but you know, here we are. Um, but, uh, it, it was, you know, I saw it, I saw the writing on the wall. So I, I, I said, I, we got to move to, I had gotten married by then. And I was like, we got to move to LA. I got to get a TV show <laughs> because I'm not going to be cartooning anymore really soon. Uh, cause everything, all the prints going away and, uh, the transition, you, you still couldn't really figure out how to make money off the internet yet. So it was kind of weird. So I moved down to LA and, um, what was interesting is I lived in the Palms neighborhood. The Palms neighborhood is right next to Culver City. Culver City was like the sleepy little hamlet in Los Angeles, which is totally gone now. <laughs> it's like Apple moved there, Amazon moved there, like all these companies have moved there and now it's just crazy and insane. But when I was there, I was just at the tail end of it being sleepy. And even like in the Palms neighborhood, there was this one uh, little uh, park I used to take my uh, baby kids to. And apparently that was the park where uh, Snoop Dogg's murder is the case record based on, like there was a murder there. So I have street credibility that I never had because uh, I used to hang out at that park with my kids. Anyway, um, I love drawing in cafes. I don't like drawing alone in my studio because it's like being a cartoonist, it's a very, it's the worst job for an extrovert like myself. So I like drawing in uh, cafes and hanging out and talking with people because that's where I get most of my ideas. So I, I found this great family owned cafe just across the street from Sony. And my wife would say, do you, you know, do you want to do the Sony tour? Do you want to do the studio tour? And I said, no, I don't want to do the studio tour. I don't want to be, I, I want to be the guy that the people on, on the tour point to and go, who's that, who's that? <laughs> and the irony is when I got the show, it was half produced by Sony. So I got to be that person sitting there where people drive by on the thing, who's that, who's that? So um, that was really cool. Um, I got it by 
meeting producers who would come into the cafe and see me drawing there, constantly working. And, and they just saw my work and started reading it and finding it was funny and said, you ever thought about writing for television? And I was like, that's what I'm here for. And uh, so I got paired up with uh, a writer that was in the business for a while. So he was able to help me sort of uh, work on creating a script. And we both bonded over our time being profiled by the police. And um, I was like, okay, like, you know, I want to do this com uh, this TV show about a cartoonist, but I just don't want him sitting there drawing because nothing's more boring than a cartoonist <laughs> sitting there drawing. So I was like, you know, let's have these surreal elements where um, maybe cartoons come to life, things come to life, start to animate. And it was, it was our director who came on board who said, you know, I don't want it to just be 2D animation. I want it to be puppetry and I want it to be computer animation. I want it to be 2D animation, like a combination of all the things. And his lookbook, this is what a uh, uh, director comes with, is uh, he comes with a vision for what the show would look like. And he came with um, Do the Right Thing, which is one of my favorite uh, movies. Um, in fact, the original script, I, I, when I was pitching the show, I just said, all I want is a scene where my character picks up a barrel and throws it against a window and it doesn't break. Like, if I could get that, then I'd be completely happy. And uh, I did get it. Um, but he came with Do the Right Thing without even knowing that that was my favorite uh, movie. Um, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind which is my favorite romantic movie, um, Amelie, which is one of my favorite French movies, <laughs> and then uh, Sorry to Bother You, which is my favorite movie by a, a Bay Area rapper that I know. <laughs> like, so um, so he, everything he came with, I was like, oh my God, this guy's perfect. And, um, and we made, a, a, you know, we got two seasons, um, we probably would have got three if someone didn't take the word woke and then make it like, the you know, the, the it, Bill Burr has a great take on what he goes. I blame the black, the, the black, the first black person that told a white person the word what woke was or, or said it in front of them. It was a great black word. It just sort of stayed with black people. And then a white person found out and goes, oh, woke. Ooh, I'm going to tell my friends I'm woke. <laughs> and that's where it went down there down the two. Anyway, um, we got two great seasons and, you know, a lot of cartoonists say to me, like, how did you manage to, like, usually when you sell stuff to Hollywood, they're like, okay, thanks. And they push you away. But the folks at Hulu were amazing. They said, we can't, cannot make this without, uh, without my input, like constantly. And so I was in the writer's room. I was, I picked out where we shot things. I was for the additions. I picked all the, uh, 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 most of the actors, the extras I picked, um, you know, I did obviously the artwork in the show, like so many, I was just every aspect of it. And it was, it was such a wonderful experience. And it's something that you can't learn in school. You just got to do. And uh, so it was a really amazing experience. And, uh, you know, I'm hoping to do it again. I'm working on um, the next project I want to do is animate it. And it's going to be based on a couple of the uh, a couple of the characters from my nightlife comic strip. Uh, it's there's one on the wall right there. Um, the one with the little kid looking at his dad's uh, teeth. That's yeah. It's, it's going to be a uh, show based on on those characters, and those characters I carved out of the contracts. Uh, so they, when they optioned everything, they optioned a certain amount of my work, but they couldn't touch that. And uh, the other thing they couldn't touch is my time as a Michael Jackson impersonator, which uh, my new book is about my time as a Michael Jackson impersonator in 1984. This is when Thriller was huge. And, um, and my high school basically did a variety show where they did Thriller as the finale. And uh, so um, I, I had no intention of being the Michael Jackson, but then someone said, um, Keith, 
you'd make a good Michael Jackson. And then someone said, oh, he's too skinny to be a Michael Jackson impersonator. <laughs> Not knowing that this person wanted to be the Michael Jackson impersonator. But just them saying that made me go, huh, I'm going to be that Michael Jackson. <laughs> and here's the thing. Uh, I didn't end up getting it. <laughs> I didn't end up getting it. But not for, I. it's because they wouldn't let me try out. And there was supposed to be tryouts, and I didn't, they didn't let me try out. They just gave it to the other guy. And I was like, that's not fair. So, um, so basically, and this is where I learned that I'm very um, passive aggressive. <laughs> so I was like, oh, okay. I'm fine with that. And then out uh, in, in, in the show, I was part of this breakdancing group. And the breakdancing group always wins the, the show all the time, uh, star of the show. Instead of wearing my breakdancing outfit, I wore, um, I dressed up as Michael Jackson and Billie Jean. <laughs> and I didn't do any breakdancing stuff. I just did Michael Jackson moves. <laughs> Thus subverting the, the final thriller thing. And then... Uh, and then at the end, everyone was like, hey, could you do my kid's birthday party? Hey, could you do this fair? Yeah, seriously. Like, so I suddenly started working as a Michael Jackson person. It was like a year and a half of, and the peak is when I toured with a Bruce Springsteen impersonator, a Madonna impersonator, and a, and a Prince impersonator. And it was, it was a very weird experience. And it's, it's in my new book. And, uh, but yeah, it was, it was fun. But all of these experiences, you know, uh, make for good stories that you can put in cartoons. And, and you know, hopefully I have, you know, used, <laughs> used my time and used my, my uh, what do you say, platform to tell f funny stories, stories that make people think, uh, and hopefully stories that, I don't know, um, sort of, I don't know, open people's minds a little bit. And um, I will say this, and I, it's not, a, I don't, you know, it's in my slideshow. I'm doing a slideshow at Malden uh, Public Library tomorrow night and then BU uh, this afternoon. But um, there is a, a, a tweet that I, I show that is really, it, it blew my mind, but it was a guy who wrote that, he was extremely depressed, and he said the last thing he was going to do was read my comics uh, before he ended his life. And he said he got into my work so much that somebody had come home. It reached him before he was able to do it. So he wrote, so yeah, uh, Keith Knight's comics saved my life. And, it, and he goes, sorry to bring you bring you down like this Keith. but it, it really is like the most amazing thing that anybody could write about anything and and I, I'm just blown away by it and I, I checked in this two years later I checked in on him I said can I can I use your tweet for my slide so he's like oh yeah yeah sure you know checked in on he's doing all right so um, but it just shows you the power of of cartooning, and I and I said this when I spoke to the kids um, up in the art department. My TV show cost twenty seven the first season twenty seven million dollars to shoot. It was based on a comic strip that cost a dollar twenty six to make. So that shows you the power of cartooning. It just takes a pen and a piece of paper. And it's not about the drawing, it's about the writing. Um, you can be the greatest artist in the world, but if you, your ideas are not well thought out, and it's not about, the, not about physically the writing, but the concept or what you're trying to do, people are going to look at the art and go, oh, that's cool, and then read it and go, eh, and not read it again. But you could draw stick figures. If the writing is good, people will return to it again and again. XKCD is an example of it. It's an online comic strip that's been going for years. It's just stick figures, but it's a really smart comic strip. So when people say, oh, I, I, you know, I can't, I can't do a comic strip. Memes are comics, you know? Hieroglyphics are comics. Cave paintings are comics. It's the oldest medium. So, um, 
So I hope that when you see all this, you're inspired, even if you don't get them printed, they make great notes. You know, people retain notes when they doodle them more. Um, it's great for therapy, getting ideas out and dropping it in notebooks. You know, I look at my notebooks not only as sketchbooks, but I look at them as diaries, not in the conventional sense, but I know exactly what I was thinking about when I look at the sketches in, the di uh, in my sketchbooks. And there's some samples right here. What I like, and this is great, by the way. Uh, I love, you know, his sketchbook. Here's this, I mean, this is what it takes to create, to create this stuff. Is that, that's it, that's it, you know? But here are my books. Here's a script from the show. These are some, uh, this is a calendar I do every year. I was hoping to have calendars, but uh, they're going to be printed next week. But um, does anybody have any questions about anything? No, no questions about anything. Come on, seriously. What advice would you give a 17 year old that is um, <laughs> an artist and you know, I, I, going it, into college potentially or maybe? So here's the, the advice I would give to, to anybody at any age <laughs> is uh, don't think that what you know, you know, it's the only thing you can do. Because when I first started, I was like, oh, the only thing I can do is a daily comic strip. Now a syndicated comic strip is, is not what you want to do. Nobody reads newspapers anymore. It's like it's doing full-time work for part-time money. Now it's the tween book series. So if you do Dogman or if you do uh, uh, Diary of a Wimpy Kid, that's, that's the new syndicated comic strip. If you can get that, that's a huge thing. But... Again, graphic recording, if you can tap into the graphic recording and get businesses to hire you to do, like there's so many different things that you can do as a cartoonist. Um, you can, there's so many different ways. I'm, I'm working on a thing right now about uh, um, a particular neighborhood in San Francisco, just getting um, the city to contribute um, to funding green space in this one neighborhood. And, I'm, and they're using my comics to help get the word out and an underground campaign. So, you, you, and, you know, people ask me all the time to do posters and, and, and covers for their books or, or, or uh, albums and different things like that. And I, I learned that really just from sort of scrambling. And I will say this, as an artist, it really is. It's 80% marketing, 20% art, 80% marketing. And a lot of people don't like to hear that, but that's the reality of it. You have to be out there and social. And so um, that's why I do conventions. That's why I do gallery shows. That's why I speak uh, at universities and churches and libraries. Um, I do that. I do that a lot. And I just like, I like human beings too. I, I think the worst thing that we can do is argue on the internet. I'd rather argue with you face to face. <laughs> right, is there another question? Um, so just think about your process. So um, how often might you say you have kind of a failure to launch, right? Where you have an idea, you work on it, and it doesn't, like, how much failure, I guess, is what I'm asking, is there in the process? Because uh, uh, there's a lot of success, clearly. Yeah, I mean, most of the time, yeah, the failures never see the light of day, but um, a lot of times, a, a lot of the failures are maybe sketches that are in my head or like, eh, that's not that great of an idea. There's a better idea out there. But they're in my notebooks. Um, but having that deadline, having the deadline means you're not going to be so precious with your artwork. Because I think if you don't have a deadline, you'll keep, oh, that's not good enough. That's not good enough. There were times where I've sent comics out that Later on, I improved on them when they went into a book or something else. But uh, I think having that time limit is super important. And I think that's like, like that with everything. I think every piece of art, be it a movie, be it a song, be it anything, a TV show, is it's just, about, it's just as much about what you don't have as what you do have. So um, I was saying this on... <laughs> The first season, not to compare it to, to Star Wars. And and when I say Star Wars, I mean old Star Wars. 
uh, uh, new Star Wars. Um, I, 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 I hate I hate to say admit this, but there are more uh, good good Star Trek movies than than there are more good Star Wars movies, oh, and anyway. it's hard to say. And <laughs> and then there are more good Star Wars uh, Star Trek series, and then there are Star, Star Wars series. And I've always been a Star Wars guy, but um, but. <laughs> I, I will. I will take it. I will take it. I, I will take take you to the corner and school you after. Oh, I agree. Oh, you agree? Okay, okay. So, but I used to always. Oh, these guys are so angry. They're they're walking out. These must be Star Wars guys. <laughs> so, um, no. But I kept on saying, here's the thing. George Lucas made the first Star Wars when most of the effects weren't even invented yet, and. And they ran out of money, and they had like storms, like sandstorms all over the place. And and Harrison Ford was saying, like, what are you? What is this dialogue that we're talking about? Like, and you know, what is this giant furry thing that I'm with? Like all these. But it, but you know, it, it's a classic movie, right? And a lot of it had to do with with the stuff he didn't have. Now, when he decided to make the prequels. He had all the resources in the world, computers and money and all, and he made the Phantom Menace, which is a piece of crap. <laughs> <clears throat> so it goes to show you that sometimes not having everything, and like no one, there would, no one could say no to him, like with the Phantom Menace, where people said no to him, and with Star Wars, like no, you can't do this, no, you can't do that. And his wife was there who edited, I don't know, like, I'm so nerdy. I have, like, Star Wars before his wife edited it <laughs> and then after his wife edited it. She won an Academy Award for editing. That's probably why she won. But, like, you, it's good to surround yourself with people, gen, you know, people that are smarter than you, more talented than you. And that's what I felt like I had with my show. All right. Can I ask one more question? Yes. What was a big challenge that was a pivotal moment for you? Um, okay. There's there's many challenges, but like one that like stuck out, that sticks out, and you feel like would be. So it it was a big. There was an earlier version of my TV show that a company wanted to buy a smaller a smaller company. They were interested in. I was working with a different writer. Uh, this writer. Uh, was not comfortable with race issues. It's a white guy who probably never dealt with that stuff. So we ha basically had a diverse version of Friends. It was funny. It had my characters in it. But I remember, and, and basically what happened was um, I, I got into a conversation with them, and they were like, well, you know, um, I had this deal where I get all the creative, uh, I get the creative, uh, uh, whatchamacallit, um, credit, credit, and all this different, I was like, wait, this is based on my work, what are you talking about? So we we had a, a uh, you know, this point in time, and it was like, you either move forward, and I had no idea, will I ever get a chance like this again? This could be it, you know? But I remember I had a, another buddy. This was out in L.A. I had a buddy from Boston. And this is what I love about This is the difference between Bostonians, people on the East Coast, and people on the West Coast. Like, people on the West Coast are like, oh, yeah, yeah, let's hang out. Yeah, yeah. That means they don't want to hang out with you. <laughs> Whereas, like, no one from Boston would say that. They'd be like, eh, ah, fuck you. And <laughs> so uh, I basically, my buddy from Boston said, Eh, you know, this is funny, but it's not you. This is not you. And so I, I was, you know, I, I, did, I wasn't going to move forward. So I, was, I said to my producer, you know, I, I, you know whatever this is, I'm, I'm, I want to blow it up. I'm not. And, but thankfully, we didn't have to make that decision because the company that was going to uh, buy it, they replaced their vice president of programming, and then, like, the whole thing fell apart. But when we were going to move forward... To look for another place, I said, let's just blow this up. I, I want a new writer. I want someone that 
you know, I, I, we can we can talk about these racial issues and different things. And so we move forward with that. And then I came up with a show that I will stand behind and, and c completely proud of. And that was like that moment where it was just like, yeah, that's that was a huge moment for me. Yeah. Any more questions? Uh, how did your experiences growing up in Melbourne help shape your art? Oh, it, it was huge. I mean, I talked about this in the other um, the other class, which is um, all the books and everything that we read about in history and in, in English and uh, never were people that looked like me were the heroes. Never. They were never the protagonists. So I never got a book where black people were the protagonists. I got books where the animals were the protagonists, you know, Animal Farm, uh, Beowulf, uh, uh, Jack London books, dogs. Like, so it compelled me to create comic books where people that looked like me were the heroes. So it was based on me and my friends. So I draw me and my friends doing stuff in high school. And, um, and I had a great teacher, an English teacher, who, that, who assigned us to Animal Farm. And he wanted us to do a book report. This is another pitiful, pitiful moment. Um, I asked him, I said, I can't do justice. I, I really enjoyed Animal Farm. Um, I said, I can't do justice by doing just a mere book report. I want to do a comic book report. He said, yeah, sure, go ahead. So I did a comic book parody of Animal Farm. So instead of the animals taking over the farm, I had me and my friends take over the high school. <laughs> and instead of like, you know, rules like four legs good, two legs bad, I had under 18 good, over 18 bad. And then I did caricatures of all of my teachers. And my English teacher loved it so much he held on to it and <laughs> kept it in the teacher lounge. So all the teachers were all angry at me. But he gave me an A++ and he said, you know, you capture the essence of Animal Farm perfectly, but more importantly, you should be doing a syndicated comic strip. And that was like this huge thing for me. So it was amazing to have, and I don't know if, if teachers can work, you know, now that they have to get the kids to pass a test. I don't know if teachers have the leeway to do that, you know? Um, but I learned differently and I did things differently. So it was nice to have, and it was my English teachers who did that. My art teachers thought that cartoons were lowbrow, <laughs> you know, like, okay, okay. no, you don't want to be doing that. You want to be a medical illustrator or something like that. Like, yeah, it was crazy. And, uh, and so it was my English teachers that really, really liked and urged me to, to do cartoons. So that was really cool. Did I even answer your question? <laughs> I <learned something. laughs> yeah, right. I sort of go off on my own tangents. Any other questions? No? Oh, hi. Okay. Um, um, I know that your identity has an impact on your art, and it's kind of like the way you story tell the experience of your identity. I was wondering if you think that even if you didn't comment on politics with your art, that your art would be politicized either way because of your identity. Yes, yes. I think if you're a non-white male, whatever you do is politicized, whatever you do. Because we're so used to, you know, white straight males are it. That's it. They could do whatever they want. If you want to see white straight maleness in its pure essence, like the purest, mm -hmm. watch a football game in Green Bay in December. <laughs> and in the crowd, you will see a very large, pale-skinned, drunken white man with no shirt on screaming with beers, screaming and yelling, and everybody thinks it's fine. If any of anybody else did that, <laughs> if I took off my shirt in the middle of December and was screaming like I would be tased and beaten and arrested, women taking their shirt off, oh my goodness, to, even to, to, to breastfeed a baby uh, is like, oh my, you know, Put them in jail. Like that is that is it. And so anything, anything that we do is politicized. You know, unless I mean, unless we're we're like playing football, and then we're not we're not You know, it's not political. It's what we were meant to do. But you know, take a knee. <laughs> you know, and it's like, oh my goodness, what's he doing? 
So, yes. So I say everything's politicized. Uh, to me, you seem very grounded in who you are, and you seem to um, portray this um, sort of like I'm secure and I know who I am. Um, you mentioned that you went to Hollywood and you've been all over the places, and um, I've never been there. So to me, there's like a stigma around like the whole showbiz. You got to be like, you have to swim with the fishes and you swim the other way. So how do you like deal with that and how to like? Well, I, you know, I don't live there anymore. So yeah. that's, that's a huge thing. But I don't know. I think, I, listen, I think there's something to be said about coming from from back east again, like, like, I don't know, I think people in the Northeast don't lie <laughs> as much as people on the West Coast do. And, um, um, but I, I just think that, um, I don't know, it, it's, it, first of all, I'm 57 years old. So th it took a while to, to get this comfortable <laughs> being in my own skin. And, and I want to leave this world knowing that my kids can get there far sooner than I did. And uh, so that's why we homeschooled. And that's why they're not learning all the stuff that they have to unlearn. James Baldwin said it best. Like, you have to, like, basically, you know, regurgitate and vomit up all this stuff that, you in, that you're that you ingrained, ingrained with at a young age just so you can live with yourself, you know? And um, so... You know that's why I do what I do, and and I, I think um, you know if I can turn people into onto different you know different things at an earlier age than I I, I did, and I, I said this earlier, you know, people mock people about doing your own research. I have to do my own research to find out like like true like history of my people in this country, and when. And they say, oh, no, but, that, but that's, you don't want to hear all the bad stuff. Here's the thing. Once you learn all this stuff, and I found, I really found this out when I moved to the South, because I live in North Carolina, and I would visit slave plantations, and there was the sanitized version, because you don't want to make everybody feel terrible, i.e. white people. But, uh, but then you do the research about it, and here's the thing that I found. Black people built this country. I, I, and I say this all the time. 250 years. What could you build if you had 250 years of free labor? And at, at one point, it was 7 million enslaved Africans. 7 million free laborers. And I will say to this day that this economy, U.S. economy, is affected by that by slavery because the south said if we have to pay all this free labor the economy is going to go right down the tubes and and i think the reason why there's still seven dollars an hour in some places in this country is tied to the slave the slave labor that once was here like they they don't want to pay people you know they still have slave labor in prisons like when they supposedly got rid of slavery, the one thing they said is it can be used as punishment in prisons, thus inventing the prison industrial complex. You know, we need labor. And in prison, people create, prisoners make lingerie, they make auto parts, computer parts, they do tons of stuff. And everything that's happening now, we would, if we were taught real history, we could explain everything. We could explain the disparity between black and white families. White families were able to get low cost loans to buy housing in the 30s and 40s when black people couldn't. And those then blacks were put into the worst parts of town all over the place, which is the east side of town. Most towns, the east side, the wind blows, that's where all the sewage is, that's where everything, and then they were redlined. So circle that part, banks don't give anybody uh, loans. So white families were able to build wealth all over the place. They were able to get educations uh, in all the, all the different uh, places. And here's the thing. Everyone says, oh, well, that's the South. The North benefited because 
they could charge, hey, listen, we'll pay you a dollar an hour. It's better than nothing. That's how the North benefited. All these schools own slaves <laughs> up here. The first uh, 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 slave patrol on record that I've seen is in Charlestown, Massachusetts. There is so much we don't learn that like, we should know. And all of this could be explained. And it's, it's like learning about cancer or diabetes in your family. It's better that you know so you can address it. And that's what America doesn't do. It's in a certain, the best interest of rich white people for the rest of us not to know. Because white, especially poor whites suffer from slavery, not as much as you know, people of color do, but they are victims of it too. And um, I always show that picture of, you know that famous picture from the 70s of the busing where a white dude has a flag and he's trying to stab the black dude who's a lawyer. And then, like, it's, yeah, it's poor white people pissed about busing, which is something that the rich white people did. And they're sending black people to the poor white, they're not sending them to rich places, but the white, the poor white people, instead of going after the rich white people, they're blaming the one black dude. And that's the thing, the moment uh, people come together, not the rich, but everybody, you know, who doesn't, who, who is not the 1%, get together, like, you know, it's going to be the end. It's going to be the end of some dude having a hundred billion dollars and which it should end. Nobody should have that. <laughs> Nobody should have a hundred billion. Even if you taxed him, if you took $50 billion dollars away, his life and the rest of his, the existence of his family would never change. And $50 billion distributed through the rest of us, all of our lives would change. There's no reason why we should be tolerating this. You know, we, there's no reason, no reason. All right, I, I know that did not answer any question, <laughs> but I go on rants. Uh, are any more questions? No? Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. No, thank you. Thank you. I want to mention uh, Keith has got uh, work in publications. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, you're all students. I know you're not going to spend any money on stuff, but I have stuff out here anyway. I take credit cards and give them back, and uh, and I also take cash. But um, yeah, I got prints and books and different things like that. But there's, I mean, there's free food here, so yeah, at least stay for the free yes, food and let's have a nice conversation. Kevin Carey, we met at graduation. Oh.